Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, our next uh, topic is going to be uh, the next, the last session for today, and it's one of the exciting sessions that you probably enjoyed this afternoon, um, and uh, that is uh, plastic culture application in fruits and uh, vegetable production, and it will be presented by Mr. Micah Anderson. Mr. Anderson is the extension educator in the School of Egg and Applied Sciences at Langston. He's an experienced trainer on innovative practices and techniques for profitable fruits and vegetable production. He's a farmer and he's ready to share all his experiences. Welcome, Mr. Anderson. Well, I'm not going to bore y'all because I don't, Miss Cotton may ask me a question. I might not be able to answer. <laughs> but I'm actually, I'm, uh, we're going to play a little video, uh, and it just kind of shows uh, kind of what happened with a farmer that I was working with when I was at the Ag Department. And then I'm going to do a little history because where I was born and grew up is probably not more than 25 miles from here. And I want to share a little of that, and then we'll talk about the plastic culture. Washinsky with affiliate KWTV shows us how an Oklahoma man transitioned from the tire industry to selling vegetables. Take a look. Mark Cannon seems right at home picking tomatoes off the vine. Surprising considering he's only been doing this about a year. This land that we have here, it belongs to my father-in-law. He's got eight acres here in the middle of the city. Mark worked for Dayton Tire for 12 years before it closed its doors. And my mother-in-law kind of got tired of doing a whole lot of nothing there for a while, and so she brought an article to me about the plastic culture program. That program opened up a whole new world to Mark. Micah Anderson is with the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture and heads it up. They do a lot of this in Georgia and Florida and places where they grow a lot of vegetables for grocery stores and stuff. And then we actually have some people that are just selling to some independent grocers, such as Crest and Regions and things like that. Since the plastic keeps the ground warm, farmers can plant their crops sooner and harvest them faster. It's a great way to grow produce. The Department of Agriculture takes care of all the startup costs, too, including putting in the irrigation, prepping the soil, and, of course, laying down the plastic. They also subsidize some extra costs so the farmers can get a business started. But it's only a three-year program. After that, the farmer's on their own. Mark says he's already established a pretty good clientele who appreciates his fresh off the vine produce. He says this beats a day at the tire plant any day. Yeah. As he worked at the tire plant, he created his own hole, hole puncher. It's like 625. Pretty creative, and uh, you know how back bending it is to planting stuff, so uh, a little easier to lay on your stomach and do it. So, so 
Washinsky. Uh oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is uh, where I grew up over uh, just below Conchardi Mountain. And if you was to were able to like fly from here over there, it wouldn't be probably more than 25 miles. And you could see the little red dot up there exactly where it's at in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, so we're in a broken era now. But, uh, you know, our church was up, uh, you know, a few miles away. My grandma lived across the road. Uh, and we had, a, our house was a little bit off the road there. Uh, this is a, <clears throat> the church that I grew up in. It's not there anymore. Got burnt down, but uh, that was my mom and my dad and the pastor. But uh, that was uh, quite, quite a bit. I mean, uh, we just, this is the first of March, but uh, February was Black History Month, and there was a lot of small black churches all over the rural uh, part of Oklahoma. And many people uh, may not know that Wayman Tisdale came here because his dad was a preacher, and uh, it was a little church like this that needed a pastor, and, and uh, they called him. They were living in Fort Worth, Texas. The reason they came up here was to pastor that little church. Uh, so th this is just uh, some records when I was a kid. And some of this, you know, maybe you have some background and maybe, you know, this what, you know, I had that background and I got, I got out of it because I was forced to do it, but now I do it because I, I want to do it and I kind of do it on my own time. Uh, but, you know, we, we raised cotton. Uh, so and that was me in the circle there uh, in 1965 at uh, six years old. So, you know, nowadays you're probably getting thrown in jail for having kids out there doing picking cotton, pulling cotton or whatever. Uh, a little bit, my dad uh, received this letter um, from the Muskogee County uh, Extension Office <clears throat> in 1949. He was 28 years old. Uh, and they asked him to, uh, to come and, and be kind of help with reaching out to uh, the rural Muskogee County as a leader <clears throat> because he was, he was a, a very successful farmer even at that age. Uh, and even was buying uh, his, uh, his first new truck that year. And uh, so they had asked him to come and meet with them. They was gonna have somebody from Stillwater to come down and uh, meet with them and it's funny, <laughs> I never had ever been to Stillwater until I went to work for the Palmer Bag. Because uh, Muskogee at that time was really booming. And the, the fair and all that stuff was uh, big time. Uh, but uh, uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's just kind of in my <coughs> family's legacy. Uh, some of the things, <clears throat> you know, that uh, we went through, it wasn't easy. And as far as never, it's not going to be easy today. Uh, but when he bought his new truck, um, this was in, let's see, 19, 1949. <clears throat> so he bought a new one, uh, 1949 pickup. But this other stuff is what he had to put up. Uh, his uh, 44 Formal uh, H tractor, uh, his, uh, uh, his seven foot tandem disc, two bottom plow, uh, two row tractor cultivator, uh, two, uh, two row tractor planter, David Bradley, uh, uh, trailer with rubber wheels on it, uh, miscellaneous farming equipment. Uh, then he had to mortgage his 10 year old horse, thousand pounds, nine year old horse. Uh, he had five cows. They were mixed colors, three to six years old, a red heifer, six months, a black boot, uh, sow, Spotted and three Schultz. And then he had to mortgage all of his crops for 1950, the next year. But he made it through it. And uh, I, was, uh, I was born in 59. And if he hadn't have made it through it, I think I may not, I don't know if he would have had more kids because he was having, we were kind of coming along to help on the farm. And if they would have lost everything, he might have had to move to town. So I, uh, Another picture here, I was, uh, had a chance to go to Israel while I was at the Ag Department. It's been about, 
It's been six or seven years ago now. Time passed so fast. But they're really big in seedless watermelon. But the seedless watermelon was developed here in Oklahoma um, by a breeder, Glenn Price, and his brother, Bruce. Uh, so that's a legacy that Oklahoma has that a lot of people may not know. Uh, this is a farmer's market that we did in Langston, uh, I think a year or so after I got there. Uh, and we grew everything in, our, in the garden that we put there and <clears throat> with the platyculture system. So everything you see there, we grew it. It wasn't, and uh, you know, so uh, it's a productive system that really works well if you manage it right. Uh, this is another picture from Israel. Uh, so their tomatoes and uh, vegetables and stuff like that, they're the, they're the, the bigger crops. Where in Oklahoma, uh, it's the commodities that's, that are the bigger crops. Uh, but, you know, things are changing, so there are more people, I think, in the world growing food, and I think it's, it's necessary. Because uh, you think about if we have a breakdown in, in transportation, uh, what kind of fix we would be in, because a lot of our food is coming from Mexico, Florida, and California. And uh, this is just a a worker, and a lot of the, the workers that they used there were from Thailand, where here we use a lot of workers from Mex Mexico. So, okay, so I'm gonna get into the plastic culture system. Uh, <clears throat> these, these two fields, both of these fields was a year that it was raining a lot. And you think about this as an irrigated system, you think of it probably more of a system that you're using uh, when it's dry, but it also helps you when it's wet because the plastic sheds off the water and doesn't let it be muddy underneath there so that the plants and roots rot and dry and drown. But there's actually water standing in between those rows and we were still getting production. So the benefits of plastic culture is uh, earliness, <coughs> uh, weed control, so where the plastic is, you're gonna be is not you're not gonna have a problem with weeds. You might have a little bit of weed problem in the hole. Then you just have to deal with the weeds in between the plastic. Uh, water conservation. Uh, so there's a drip line. You can see the drip line running underneath the plastic. Uh, that uh, is a drip irrigation that only goes to the roots of the plant. It actually goes deeper than an overhead watering type system. And then you can actually fertigate through that, which we'll talk about some more and you don't lose your fertilizer, uh, and your water don't evaporate to the sun because it's underneath the plastic. And you can make, the machine you can actually use to make raised beds without plastic if you just want drip irrigation without the plastic. And then uh, reduction in nutrient leaching, as I was just talking. Uh, so if you, if you put fertilizer uh, down and then you put the plastic over it, then when the rain comes in, it leaches nitrogen really bad. So with the, with the plastic, you don't get that leaching as much. And then you can add nitrogen through the drip and you don't lose it uh, just from a rain that comes the next day or something to that sort. Uh, alleviation of soil compaction. So you also get that, uh, if you were to pull the plastic up, you could feel, see how moist and mellow the soil is just like you did when you first tilled it. It doesn't come packed back. <clears throat> uh, then root uh, reduction in root pruning, and something that you kind of don't think about, but when you, when you grow on bare ground and you're chopping right up next to that plant, you're actually damaging the root of that plant a little bit. With the plastic, you don't get as much of that. Yes, ma'am. The, be the best way, probably, they, they make a tool um, that, uh, uh, that lifts it up. It's a sideways plow that runs underneath it and lifts it up. Uh, well, it's much lifter, I believe. Uh, you, you know, they sell it at uh, uh, Irrigation Mart or uh, the Morgan County Seed, you can get them. Uh, I mean, that, but some people that don't have that, uh, they don't want to spend that kind of money on it. You can get a cultivator and put real wide sweeps on it and take all the middle teeth out and make the sediment at the width of the edges of the plastic 
and run that underneath there and, and kind of get it up. But you still got to walk back down through there and pick it up. Now, they do have another machine that's more expensive, but I've never used it, that picks it up and it rolls it up. And I don't know how well it works, but uh, and a lot of this has to do, uh, you know, I don't, is your soil clay or sandy? So you're, then it's easier to get out that type of soil. Like the places where they do plastic culture in Florida, that, it's like beach sand. Uh, but the, the problem with that, with that beach sand is it has really nothing in it. Like our soil does have stuff you can, you can actually smell, or just our soil, but it's easier to get plastic up out of that sand and uh, stuff. Yeah, kind of, um, uh, yeah, I know what you, so, but it's the, if the heavy clay is harder and harder. Now, if you leave it out there for more than a year, it gets harder to take up. Uh, and but sometimes there, I have done that and grown in the second year, but then when you get stuff growing between the rows, the harder and harder it gets to get it up. That was my next question. Uh, so you get an improved quality and a greater yield. So because the plant's getting everything it needs, the soil is loose. You're not. It's uh. It's it's warming up earlier. Uh, you're going to get more more fruit. You're going to get a greater yield, and, and it, it almost some of sometimes we can get stuff that looks like it's grown in a greenhouse. So this is the machine that. Uh, well, that's not the exact same machine that we have now, but it's pretty, it's just like the one we have in the tractor. Uh, so the the plastic is on that machine, and you tie the, the drip tape is up there on a wheel in the middle, and, it, and you tie it to this uh, stick, stake, and then you stake the plastic down with that uh, tool there, and then you pull away and it unrolls. <coughs> uh, and that, that particular uh, tool that I used to stake the plastic down with, it actually, I won an innovation award <laughs> with that one year, because they, it, they basically have, most of the time, people just have people stand back there, which is kind of dangerous. And so I decided to, my brother at the time, uh, liked the weld and stuff, and we just got like a railroad tie, and we put two spikes on it about so long, and uh, put two handles on it, and we dropped that down to hold it down. And uh, so I was in uh, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, and uh, this lady came up and says, oh, I'm so glad I ain't got to stand behind that tractor no more. So, yeah, because, I mean, if you mess around and like this, my tractor, the shovel shift, you hit the, the rear and you back over somebody before you know it. So there are different machines. This is a machine uh, that, uh, that's, that's made for uh, the BCS. Well, I don't know if it's exactly made for a BCS, but you can hook it to a BCS. And, uh, but it doesn't raise it up. Uh, but it's all, it's, I, what I've, I've used this, this flat like that, and I didn't, um, some things don't do well, especially peppers, especially in our clay soil. But, it, but what we did, we would take a rake and make the raised bed, or a weed eater with a rotor till on it and raise the bed up, and then lay the plastic with that, and it worked good. We did this, we do this at the Palm of Ag, uh, because the rows are so short, you just can't get a tractor, a full-size tractor in there. So it, this is something that could be used in a backyard. It could be used in a hoop house and things like that. <clears throat> There's also a machine that Johnny sell uh, uh, that, uh, that you, two people pull it by hand. And uh, so these, <laughs> these boys here uh, work there at Langston. Well, one of them is a student, and the other one works me, but uh, they were trying to get it adjusted and everything, but uh, probably, but if you got it adjusted right, and the soil needs to be really tilt, uh, tilt really good tilt, because if it's got a lot of trash and debris, which this has some in it, it's kind of hard to really make it work very, very good. And so there's a header line that goes across, it's safe as you got 10 rows, so you got a main line that goes across, and then each row has a a line that goes underneath the rows, and then there's uh, you can you can get just regular valves, but I like these shutoff valves where you can shut the rows off. The reason being is that if you got and I like to plant the same thing on a row, because if you got okra on a row and you got tomatoes on another row, 
the tomato is going to need a lot more fertilizer and a lot more water. So you can shut that okra row off and not water it as much. And if you water okra too much, it'll just grow big and it won't give you hardly any okra. And I've experienced that. We, was, uh, we had this system and we were watering and watering and these okras were this tall and they hadn't got nothing. And we had somebody that knew something, that knew about okra, came out and looked at it and says, if you shut that water off, you're going to have a lot, a whole bunch of okra. We shut the water off, and next week she started picking so much okra, she lost 25 pounds that year picking okra. <laughs> so this is the, the injector we use. There's a lot of different kind of injectors out there, and the farmers are all really creative. And he, he kind of rigged this up like this. So normally it's just a swimming pool uh, canister that you uh, put chemicals in a swimming pool with. So what we're doing is we're putting fertilizer into our garden. And so you, so you got the canister and you put the top, take the top off and put the fertilizer in there. And then you got a filter and you want to filter your fertilizer because it can, uh, the drip tape has little bitty emitters and it can get stopped up. And if you have like sand in your well, or uh, granules in the fertilizer, any of that can stop it up. So you want to uh, have a good, uh, a good uh, thing to, to filter it out, a fil good filter. And then uh, those that check valve kind of hold the pressure down where the pressure is not overloading <clears throat> your, your lines. And now we're going to have, we're going to go, the tour we do on Thursday, we'll end up at a garden, and we have a, a garden similar to this out there. If, if the ones that's going to be riding the bus. So uh, this is another guy. He was on my program when I was at the Ag Department, and he lives in Elk City. And he has so many people calling him to come put gardens in, he can't get to them all. And, uh, but I, he's, got, he's got this silver plastic right here. It's got black in the middle. That I'm going to try some of that this year. Uh, and it's supposed to, that silver is supposed to be sure some of your bad bugs, like squash bugs. I don't know how good it works, but that's kind of what they're saying. And then you can get red plastic, you can get blue, you can get green. So you got some red there. We used some red one year. It's supposed to be good for tomatoes. I don't something about the red and the red tomatoes and and uh, but it, it seems like they, the tomatoes done well. But we really need to do a trial where we did the tomatoes on the red and do it on the black and see what the difference is. Huh? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, he got this. He told me somewhere up north. I don't know if Irrigation Mart's got this or not. I got to check, but they got about everything. Okay. Uh, but he got this uh, from, he gets this stuff from somewhere, uh, a company up north in Iowa. Okay. That's just another one of his gardens that he put in. And uh, this is his tomato uh, crop. And you can see how prolific this, uh, this stuff is, can be in this plastic when everything, you've given it the water and the fertilizer and everything that it needs. This is uh, before they got big. And he goes through a lot of trouble to do a lot of this staking and wires to, and if, you know, it's just gonna make everything better in the end when you're picking, because it goes up through there and you just reach through there and pick. And it holds them, and you have a little less diseases and all that because you're holding the, the tomato upright. I don't do all that because I don't consider myself a tomato grower that much. I grow, I grow some, but you know everybody's got their niche, and this is uh, his, he's a big time tomato guy. Uh, this is kind of like an aerial shot of his deal. And you can see the header line, and then the lines going through each row rows. I really like this. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I noticed that all this is on flat level ground. And I understand for the drip irrigation that that would be important. But is the plastic itself suitable to like grow on a slope or on a contour? Yeah, I have. A, uh, I've done it on terraces, on the, like on each side of a terrace. Uh, because now. The machine that we got is the only kind of machine, I call it the Cadillac machine, it has a thing in the back that it kind of contracts, and so it can 
take a little bit of a curve as you go around. Uh, so if you, uh, uh, if you was like we, this garden we did here in Tulsa is on a little bit of a slope. But what I did is I went out in front of that garden and made a terrace in front of it so when the water come down, it would run around it. Because if you get the water washing through there too much, it's going to wash the dirt away from the plastic. And, and if you can get it settled down, maybe it'll get a little bit of something. If it kind of growing up around it, it kind of hold, helps hold it down. But yeah, you, you can't get too much of a slope, but you can get some. And uh, strawberries, I've had uh, one organic couple, uh, Mike and Emily, out here at Oaks. Uh, they were trying to grow strawberries. And strawberries, if you ever grew them, they, they just don't get very high. They're just, you know, this, you know, the, the, and if you, you, it's hard to weed because they're running everywhere and you're trying to pick them in the grass and you can't find them. But on the plastic, you can just see them. And uh, to me, that's the only way to grow them outside. Now, the other way I've seen that people grow them is in baskets and hoop houses, which is a good way also. But uh, this way, because you can't really hardly wash them, but they're laying there and they're just clean. This is just another picture of strawberries. And I think what he did, he planted rye, because we planted, in the plastic culture, strawberries, we plant them in October. And we take them through the winter season, and he planted like a, a winter rye. And then when it gets time to harvest, that rye starts to die because it don't like the heat. I think it's what he, some type of crop that grows in the winter. And no, not really, because, uh, uh, usually they come off really early. The strawberries, if you do it in the plastic and you plant them in October, uh, it wouldn't be, you would be getting pretty close to getting production here by uh, this month, in late March and then in April. And by uh, uh, May and June, they're done. Well, when, what happens is that you get the foliage you, the plant has enough foliage by the time it gets hot, it usually shades it. But the other thing you can do, so you can, some people whitewash the plastic white. And then if you plant in late, you can just plant, or, or use a, the other side of this plastic is white. You put the white side up. And it still gives you that moisture control and it actually warms the soil a little bit too, but not as much as the black. So if you're gonna plant late, then you might wanna use the white plastic. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when I, first, I I had the problem with gophers too. The first thing I did, I went to the thickest plastic or drip tape that you can buy. So what what thickness do you use? I think it was just a regular. Yeah. So I use a. Yeah, I use a 15 mil uh, drip tape. That helped. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, unless, I mean, you can use, I mean, you can, you can kind of find out where they're at and put a trap and try to trap them, or, you know, you can use the paws and peanuts or whatever. But uh, other than that, I don't know. Yeah, it's, they can be, they could, if it gets really hot and dry, they're, all that stuff is looking for water. Uh, this is sweet corn. Uh, I don't know that you get more sweet corn in plastic, but it show, it grows super fast. I've had sweet corn ready in like 50 days. Crazy. And then, but the one thing I, I just, just general knowledge to share about sweet corn is that you don't want to plant one row of sweet corn uh, because it's wind pollinated. You know, some things are pollinated by bees and stuff. It's totally pollinated by the wind. The tossel is the male and then the shoots are the female so it's got to do with the wind blowing across it. And uh, so if you plant four rows, your production probably gonna be better than if you have one row. But if you had six or eight, it might even be better. And I've, you know, I've, one of the stories that I like to share with people is about the, a farmer that always had the best corn. <clears throat> and he, he would, uh, the media wanna know how he always had the best corn. He said, cause he said, sure, 
the seed corn with his neighbors. And they was confused. And, he, he, and they said, no, we want to know how you, he said, I just told you. He said, because it's wind pollinated. And if, if somebody on the east and west has got seed corn from my corn, and I, when you give seed corn, seeds away, you want to get, you give the best. In the north and south, in whichever way the wind comes, it's coming my way. And so the best corn is going to be in the middle. And so that's how you always had the best corn. And so that's how we should live our life, really. We should share our best seeds with everybody because there's always going to be winds and storms in, in life. And then when, when you get in trouble, then all your neighbors come to your help. So this is, uh, I believe this is uh, pumpkins. And see, this is on white plastic. And so, so, you know, so pumpkins you would plant late in the season and you're doing while it's so hot. And it, it, if you're trying to start plants from a, from a start, a seed or a little, that can be, the black can almost be too, too overwhelming. So by this, uh, be it a, a something that you would plant late in the season, they use white plastic. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, my garden uh, in Piedmont some years back. And what I did here is uh, we got peas. I put two rows of peas, but I put okra down the middle. And so that kind of a good companion. The peas will produce, and then they'll kind of be done, and then the okra will keep on producing till the, till the season ends. Um, so, <clears throat> and then uh, this is a, a squash on the ends here, watermelons. Uh, and what I do for, uh, uh, to, uh, because of, you know, Dr. Tracy was talking about the squash bugs, and how, how much of a problem they are. And so what I do is I put, they seem to like zucchini, but I, from my experience, that seems to be their favorite. And then the yellow squash is their next favorite. And then my watermelons is kind of like third on their list. So I put squash on each end of my rows of watermelons every time. And so then if I have to do something to deal with them squash bugs, I never have to spray the watermelons for them. I may have to spray the squash. I usually always get squash, but I'm not, that's not my main focus. My main focus is my watermelons and my cantaloupes. So this is uh, my watermelon patch uh, with the plastic, but at this point, the vines are so prolific, you can't see the plastic anymore. So this is uh, some black diamonds. Uh, back when I first started in it, that's all I knew was black diamonds and crimson sweet. And I, I, don't, I barely grow black diamonds anymore because it seems like I only, um, out of 10 watermelons, I might get two that's good. Uh, so uh, Richard here, who he used to be my neighbor, we, we, used to, we had houses right next to each other. He, he used to come over and steal my watermelons. <laughs> 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 and my wife would call his wife, Richard don't have to come, don't have to do that. He can just come over here and get, he says, oh, they taste better when I steal them. So anyway, but uh, I, he was asking me, and I told him, my favorite two watermelons right now come from Will Height. They're, they're a big watermelon seed company. They're not as big. They're kind of going, dwindling down a little bit. Uh, some people that passed away that used to do some of the seeds down there, but Peddler and Gold Stripe is my two favorite watermelons. Uh, from Will Height Seed. And then Crimson Sweet is high on the list. It's an it's a open pollinated watermelon that's a air, kind of an heirloom that you can replant the seeds. Uh, and, it's, uh, and people ask for it at the market. And you don't seem to have the big, as much of a problem with it like you do the black diamond. The black diamonds, they will develop sometimes. And then if it rains, then they'll start growing again and you have that green middle and everybody brings them back to you. And it's like, it waste, and they take so much energy out your soil. Uh, cantaloupes, what I liked about this, this was a year that it was raining a lot, wet, but the cantaloupes was laying on the plastic and they didn't rot so fast. Because you know, you gotta pick cantaloupes really quick. And we do, we're doing a trial because one of my favorite cantaloupes called a sugar queen, you can't get the seeds anymore. And I, I don't think you can get the Super 45 seeds anymore, although I got some left over from my last two couple of years. 
So we're trying to find something that's replaceable. And so we're doing a trial. We've done one trial last year, and we're going to have to do it again this year, a couple more years, to see how, uh, which one we like the best. So far, the one that's the good size, that's a new variety uh, that I kind of like, is called Sugar Rush. And not everybody carry it. I think Seedway had it, but Johnny's don't have it. They have a smaller one, um, Sugar Cube, but it's just too little. But the Sugar Rush was a good, was a nice size. So uh, we're starting uh, June, this month, the 17th in Taft. We're starting a garden school, and what we will we will actually do is we'll put a, a plastic culture garden in, in the, uh, one of the empty lots in the town of Taft. And we'll do half of the class will be outside training, and the other side half will be inside PowerPoints. And it will we'll go to March every month. We'll, uh, from a month next, we'll go each month, and we'll do different things. Like the, the following month, we'll, the first month will be telling people, teaching them how to seed and start their plants and all that kind of stuff. Uh, then April, we'll probably do some planting and stuff like that. And then it'll, then somewhere down the line, we'll, deal, we'll talk about pests. We'll have Dr. Tracy come out, and she'll do an even longer talk than she did today about how to deal with the pests and, uh, and deal with the weeds uh, and uh, different things like that. <clears throat> and we'll, uh, and I, I got some uh, uh, holes, some different kind of holes that I got. Because when I got, when I started, when I first moved to Piedmont and I was next to Richard, I went to Home Depot or somewhere trying to find a good hole, and I couldn't find one. So I, I ran run across this company called Rogue Hole, and they take disc blades and make holes out of them. But uh, what the one that I like that I never would have thought I would like is a triangle, and it's flat. And you just scrape it across the ground. It doesn't take as much energy as those old kind that you're chopping and pulling as much. So I got one of those I'm going to show out at the, at the tour on Thursday. But uh, we'll go all the way through October. We'll, there'll be a session on marketing, how we set up a table, all that kind of stuff. Uh, trying to think some of the, uh, how to deal with wildlife, keeping wildlife out. Uh, just everything that we can think of to deal with market gardening. And then you also get a notebook that you can refer back to in everything. So, and then we give you a certificate. Uh, and this was last year in Bowley. And uh, this young lady, uh, Nicole, was crying because her, her family uh, had a uh, dad uh, farmed and she had gotten away from it, and uh, she wants to do something with her family's land, and, and uh, she was just uh, go, so happy to be able to go through that class and get a certificate and everything. So this is the pretty much the end. Uh, if you got any questions, uh, but my contact information is here. Uh, that office number, kind of delete that and call, because I'm hardly in the office. But uh, my cell number is there, and then that's my email. I have a laptop, so I can get my email. <laughs> Lenny, yes, yes, ma'am. It can, yeah, uh, for the most part, but uh, we have. I have, you can get two seasons out of it. And sometimes it's according to what you're growing. Like if you grow watermelon and cantaloupe and you, you, you plant them, uh, you know, three or four feet apart, so you just got a hole every three or four feet, and then they take a lot of energy, but you could definitely come back that next year and plant okra there. And, uh, and then you can run fertilizer through there and maybe grow, you know, you want to plant something different. Uh, so yeah, you can. Uh, we have had people get two years out of out of it, uh, but it gets a little hard to get out of the ground once you leave it that long. Yeah, so it's a kind of a catch twenty two. Yes. Ma'am. Do yeah, they do do well. I but what I had some at the apartment bag and it was like it's red clay, and they need that raised bed effect. So that the water can drain, because when they they sit in water, they don't they don't have a very deep root yeah. system. Yeah, they do they do well. They it might be a, a crop that might be that you might want to use white. 
Yeah. No, it, I, because when, when I did it with the BCS and I just laid the plastic flat, they didn't. And then I came back and raked it and made a raised bed the next year and they done all right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What was that question? Have you tried the Bio 360 instead of the plastic? The biodegradable plastic? Uh, yeah, I've, well, I've talked to the people about it. Um, it had, unless, now, I need to check back into it. But originally, it wasn't uh, released for organic re reuse because uh, it was like coming apart and flying in trees and, and some different things. They they needed to make it where it degraded a little slower or some things. I, I think uh, the sun would hit it and it, that part would degrade and then the other part in the ground wouldn't. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but uh, but they I think they're real close to getting some that works. Is the plastic acceptable for organic gardening? Yes, it is. Now you know if you have, if you have an organic certification, I think you have to take it up at the end of the year. But yeah, you can use stuff like. Uh, um, oh, fish emulsion, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. Uh, uh, you know, you want to try to make sure you get all your, your nutrients in the ground ahead of time, a lot of it. But uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not organic because I grow watermelons and they need so much fertilizer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mean to starting out to get a new machine? If you're just starting, not necessarily the machine, like the type of plastic, like the brand, and then where would you get that? Oh, Irrigation Mart in Louisiana is always, it's just a really good place. They can explain all kinds of stuff to you. It's 1-800-SAY-RAIN. You can get it in Oklahoma City at American Plant Products. Uh, but uh, Irrigation Mart, can, they have engineers down there that can explain all kinds of stuff to you. And they also sell you the, ma sell the machines. And uh, there's a notes machine that's much cheaper than the Rainflow. The ra uh, notes machine, I think, is like $2,000. The Rainflow machine is, is $4,500, $5,000. And then you can get it in different widths. Like the ones that you've been seeing, the me, I'm ha it's like four foot wide, but they have a machine that can do five foot wide. But if you do five foot, you probably need to do double drip. Yes, ma'am. Are, are these machines rentable for people who are already using them? No, not that I know of. <laughs> know. But, but, you know, it was funny. OSU, had, we was in a meeting, and I guess I need to re-meet with them. They were talking about maybe like putting some machines like uh, different places that people could check them out. And one of the places we talked about was at Haskell. But when we was talking, they were going to close that facility down. But they said they were going to open up another one close by. So I need to get back with them on that. Where, where are you at? Stewart. Stewart. Uh, Over by Metallica. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs>